Hi, my name is Shane Chartrand. I am the chef of Nehiao Indigenous Cuisine. I wrote a book called Toao, Progressive Indigenous Cuisine as well. The big thing about my life and my culinary arts story is really driven around the perspective of people because I may think that I have a specific way of cooking or a certain way of believing or thinking about what I do. I really thrive on other people's thoughts and opinions. Also, the biggest thing about that is making sure that I harness people's storytelling. Storytelling is really important to my life. It always has been because it gives me a stretched exaggeration of what a person really is like, especially if they get excited about it. Somebody could be talking about jams, jellies, meat cuts, or whatever it may be. The biggest thing that I enjoy about those kind of stories is what angle, where are they coming from, where's their childhood, how did they learn these techniques. So the thing about that kind of perspective, it gives me more so not just me thinking about just myself. So we're in this, this crazy rat race of trying to be the better chef or the best chef, there's no such thing. All we gotta do is live on this earth, cook great delicious food, and hope that other people enjoy what you've created. And that's kind of my, that's my philosophy in a nutshell. And that's how I live my life. So I wanted to dig a little bit into my book that I wrote, Tuau, Progressive Indigenous Cuisine. The word Tuau means come in, you're welcome, there's room. It's interpreted in different ways though. That's not the exact interpretation of that specific word. The indigenous, the indigenous vocabulary is really interesting because a lot of things don't mean just one word. Like Tuau doesn't just mean one word specifically, but that's kind of the way the language is. The more you get to know it, the, the more interesting it gets. It's actually very easy language. Regarding the book though, what I wanted to discuss was a different word that I believe I, I was able to harness everything I could find in my personal arsenal of culinary arts and my personal life period is the word I'll teach you right now called tapui. Tapui was a word that I used when I was when I do my travels because tapui means truth and the one thing that we got to do in life is not exaggerate or try to exploit or, or take advantage of. So the, the best I do in my world um, is to try to make sure that I follow that word when I'm being honest to somebody or people that want to know a little bit about me. Tapui is the word truth. For instance, in our community, which is what I am, Cree, I am Plains Cree. But so the story, this book is, says progressive indigenous cuisine. That just means that food is ever changing. Um, I don't follow just one specific line of culinary arts. That's why progressive indigenous cuisine made sense to me. Now, the cool thing is if you open the book and read it, there's actually people like Ryan O'Flynn, there's Cowboy Smith, there's other people that I've included in the book, and that's because they're from the Munyao community, Munyao, non-indigenous community. So I'm able to share what the white in a medicine and a medicine wheel looks like because I feel that we should all be together. I'm a very strong indigenous man, I'm a very strong Nehio man, but I'm also Shane Magic Chatron. I come from new, two names and that's Shane St. John Gordon. And that's also Shane the chef, Shane the indigenous man, and just Shane Chartrand who just likes to do whatever I want to do. It's a storybook about a lot of people, a lot of opinions, a lot of great stories, and ultimately too, great recipes. Okay, so I want to review with you a couple knives and tools that I like. <clears throat> I have them all the time in my little culinary knife world. Um, the one that I cherish the most, actually I don't use it the most, but it is the one I cherish, is this guy right here. And the reason why this knife matters to me is because when Knifeware first opened, this was my very first purchase. Handmade Japanese knives were, were new to me. So when Knifeware opened up, we were able to learn with them. And thanks to the Knifeware crew and staff, we were literally in a world where, you know, I'd see something that had a Japanese little carving in it, and that's immediately Japanese to me. But it's so much further. Obviously, that was just a long time ago, so don't judge me on my, my ignorance of not knowing enough. This one here is my second favorite, and the reason why this one is, um, is because for me, I like long knives. I like long, thin, precise knives. Some of the work I do is very precise, and this is the knife I use the most. Not just because it's totally pretty and awesome, it's also very lightweight. For a good knife that I enjoy that's a little, this one, this is a little stronger. This guy here I like quite a bit. Initially, I was concerned about this tip a little bit, but once I got to learn how to use this knife a little bit better, this one became my real overall chopper. N not chopper as in butcher or a hard hitter, but it certainly just holds up very well. And the one thing I'm forgetting about this one too, and all three are the obviously the handles um, are nice and comfortable, nice and light, easy to clean. Those are those. Uh, a couple small things I like. This is pretty, and I get it. <laughs> and I get this is pretty. Say what it is, but it is pretty. But it's also really good. I like it because when I'm saucing plates, 
This little lip on the bottom helps it from kind of splashing around. It's got a little bit more control as it drips off the spoon. So that one's always with me. Uh, microplane, I'm a huge lover of light colors. Um, it's weird because I love Harleys, I love tattoos, I love metal music, but my favorite colors are peach, pink, and baby blue. So there you go. Tweezers, everyone seems to love and hate and make fun of them and say what you will. Oh, I'm tweezer chef. Well, you know what? Sometimes I need them. I like the big guys. These are the ones I bought from Knifeware. This isn't really as intricate as you think. People think that we are tweezer chefs. It, this is not necessarily what I use it for. Sometimes when you get when you get a little clamshell of flowers or buds or whatever you have, it's easy to kind of separate them and then just pick the ones you like all best. And obviously the last one here is for me because I'm in Treaty, Treaty, Six, Treaty 7 territory and I'm from Treaty 6 territory. So I like to always keep this guy in my knife, in my knife bag, as you can see. That's the one that is a real protector. I got no purpose for him besides keeping myself away from those Treaty 7s. Okay, so I'm hanging out here at the studio, making some beef tartare. It'll be delicious, I know it. I love making tartare. You know the funny thing about beef tartare is the one thing that I'll always order on a menu for me to tell how great the chef is. Everyone's got prepare an egg or do this, make the perfect steak for me. Tartar is cold. Cold food's tough to make delicious. Warm and hot food's easy to make delicious. Steak tartar is my is my go-to to always tell the pedigree of how awesome the chef is. Anyways, we'll see you this afternoon. I'm headed to Knifeware later on to sign some books. In the meantime, I'll just be some cooking. We'll see you there. So I'm gonna make my bison tartare for you. So I got a piece of bison right here. We'll start with this. We'll start with cutting this guy up a little bit. And what I'm gonna do is cut off a little bit of the fat and set that aside. I usually keep things aside. You never know what I might use it for later on. See, the good thing about bison though, it's very lean. That's what makes it very good for you as well. Now, when it comes to tartare, this is the thing. Some people like it uh, kind of rough cut. Some people like it very fine. Personally, because of my age, I'm in between. I'm thinking like the cool cat young guys that like it kind of rougher, but I'm also one of those guys that was trained uh, French, traditional classic French cuisine, so I do like it very nice and fine. So what I'm gonna do now, cut this guy up into just little pieces, of course. Now this is how I kind of uh, dice. I'll set that little, that little hill there, chop some more up into just like chiffonade sort of pieces of meat like this. Um, preferably don't just take the big piece of meat like this and chop it up heavily. If you choose to, you can. What I like to do just for precision, I will take this little guy, break it into three. And then this is where I will start mincing, 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 mincing until I get what I want for my chopping consistency. So this is, this is kind of like semi-fine. That's the kind of way I like tartare, and I'll tell you why. It's not necessary just because of the flavor. I like it this way because it's easy to spread on the toast or the crostinis or whatever you're offering with your tartare. And then I'll do the same thing with the other three little meat hills or whatever term you want to call it. When I wrote the book, I said at the beginning of the, the beginning of it, my book is an inspiration to whatever journey, culinary journey you want to go. So you can use my ingredients or the recipes as a starting point. You don't need to follow them perfectly. And the reason I'm explaining that to you is because I am gonna go organically on this recipe today. But keep in mind all the ingredients that I have in, in the studio here are from the book, are from the recipe. Now I know that I can go a little bit quicker. It's broken down more, there we go. And scrape, boom. Okay, so the meat is chopped up. Like I said, I like it. I like my tartare semi-minced. That's just up to me, that's what I like. I'm gonna grab my little container bin here, and this is where I'm gonna start working on some other things to flavor our meat. Now keep in mind, cold food is hard to make taste better, um, which means you gotta season it a little bit more and make sure you're always tasting a little bit more. Um, it's just the way it is, it's a fact. I got a little grainy mustard. I'm gonna use this guy here. And again, I'm gonna eyeball this. I'm gonna use a little bit more than I would normally use. I'm, I'm, I'm omitting salt on this particular recipe, as is the book. 
I got minced shallots, mint garlic that I use in my fridge all the time. This is one thing that is really good to do. Minced shallot, minced garlic, put it in a jar just like this. You can use it anytime. It's an awesome condiment. Um, instead of having to worry about chopping everything up all the time, it's always nice to have kicking around. Here, what I'm gonna do is gonna add some capers. This is just a basic classic recipe. It doesn't have everything that a classic tartare would have, but it's not just because of people at home, it's just because I felt like doing it that way. And what I'm gonna do now is show you how I cut capers. Squish, squish, squish a little bit. And the reason why I squish them like anything else is to sometimes people like to do this with garlic or whatever to extract oils and blah blah personally i just do it so they don't roll around so just a rough cut again when it comes to capers this is where the salt extracts from the salty flavor of the caper so this is going to be just cut up a little bit more there's the capers like that and actually to be honest with you i'm looking at that i'm going to add a little bit of the juice to it as well so right there like that that is not actually on the recipe, but I just sawed it up right now because we're allowed to. Now, what I'm gonna do is a little bit of parsley. Um, I'm a huge fan of parsley. Sometimes I just eat parsley just like this. Tastes kind of parsley on its own, but the thing is, if you garnish with food with, with little stems that are just like this and actually, and, and just like have them sticking up, it actually does make the food taste different. The same as like micro cut celery or cucumber or whatever, it's the same sort of feel gonna chop this guy up now I ripped these guys off some people don't like the stems obviously the stems being these guys here a little bit too hard to chew personally I don't totally care now really rough chop nothing crazy it's not too fine chopped up you can even see some of the pieces are a little bit bigger I'm okay with that done now we're gonna mix this guy and season him up okay I'm back so we got the tartar ready to go it's got to be mixed still I'm gonna season that guy up or just give it a mix so it's all seasoned, ready to be mixed. What I did prior is I sous vide the eggs in a circulator as you could, as you read in the book, but this is gonna be put gently on top. So I've got the spoon, slotted spoon, where I'm gonna take the egg out, just like so, separate it into a separate bowl, just like that, and set it aside. We're gonna give this tartare a quick mix. So just give it a little mix. Now, the thing is when you get a piece of meat, whether it's bison, whether it's beef or whatever, when you open up a package, unless you're gonna get it raw right from the meat itself to you, but that's not cryovac or anything, you're gonna get this kind of purginess to it, right? So what this is gonna do is give it some air, all the beautiful aerations, all the beautiful air mats, the mustard and everything in the capers that are in the tartar are now gonna kind of sit there and do its thing, bam. Okay, so now i have my egg yolk separated from al my albumin or my egg whites so that guy's hanging out here this is not just going to act as a garnish but it, it's more than that it's part of the dish you break the yolk it runs all over the tartare it just adds some uh, richness and some beauty i got the steak tartare all mixing up that's all done with all of my um, flat leaf parsley my mustard and all the stuff that i want in that okay so now what I want to do is I got a little pile of potatoes that I pre-cut, but I'm going to do some more for you. So Knifeware sells these little guys here. I'm not here trying to be Mr. Spokesman, but I kind of am because I got three of these. My favorite one's pink. No one touches it. I always know where it is. But anyway, the good thing about these guys is they're easy to store, easy to find, easy to clean. So I'm using the little Yukon Gold potatoes like so. Now, you should use a guard, but I've been doing this a long time, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I shouldn't be using a guard but I'm gonna not use a guard because I feel like it. I want my mandolin very, very thin, so then the potatoes come out nice and paper thin so that I can fry them and they're just nice and even and crispy and awesome. Take your time just like this. Take a look at your potato. This guy here, as you can see, is just the way I want it. So that's the size just like that. That's my potato. No need to rush, life is too short. Here's another tip too. If you choose not to, what I do sometimes is I will not always go down the entire potato. I will probably stop about a quarter of the way, find another use for the rest of the potato. That way I'm safe, okay? Just consider it. Mandolin's away, easy to clean. Now here's my little pile of more potato chips I'm gonna fry up. What's nice is you can take a little bowl of water like this, and then you can take all your potatoes, put them in water. There's a couple reasons for that, to rinse a bit of the starch off. And you rinse the starch off so when you're deep frying them, 
they won't stick together. If you get any of that water in hot oil, I think we understand what happens. So I'm gonna put these guys onto this little towel. I'll go like this, I'll go like this, and just kind of put it on a towel and just lay it all out and let it dry up. And then what we're gonna do from here is we're going to deep fry these potato chips that are gonna go along with our tartare. So stay tuned. Okay, so now I'm working on the potato chip part of the bison tartare. I've taken these chips, I've laid them on to, or these potatoes, laid them onto this towel. Now they're semi-dry, they curled up a little bit, which I kind of like. Now we're gonna fry them. Take little tiny batches. I got a little pot of oil on here. I bring it up. Now look, take a look at the oil. All you gotta do, like I could tell you, bring it up to 300, 250, whatever. A lot of the time you just gotta do a little bit of practice. Drop a potato and you can see right away. You can see right away if it's cooking evenly and that looks good, gonna turn it a smidgen down. Now I'm gonna start frying these chips. Now what I do is I drop them in one at, one at a time. I use the spoon to drop and this is again, if I'm cooking at home with friends, in a restaurant setting, we got hoods, we got vents, we got everything we need. At home, it's not quite the same thing. And I just do a little bit at a time so I can keep an eye on which ones are cooking a bit quicker than the other. This one gets guy right here. I'm gonna transfer them over to this little kind of like mesh prep tray that I have. And that's where I'm gonna take this kosher salt, which is my favorite, next to a Malden. And I'm going to keep stirring and just hit it with a bit of salt while it's warm. And I do that so the salt does stick to the potato, a couple more, and then keep in mind that they will cook after you pull them out. So if you're wondering why your potato chip is a little bit too dark, that's probably because you pulled them out a little bit too late. Okay, my oil is turned off, everything's good. What I'm gonna do here now is start plating my tartare. I always keep a spoon with me just in case I gotta eat real quick. Okay. So pick your plate of choice. This guy right here is mine. You can get really deep into conversating about plating or whatever, thinking, dreaming, whatever. That's all up to you. I implore you to do more. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick a ring mold. I'm gonna do something for the first time that I've never done before, right before your very eyes. I'm going to do bison tartare with three ring molds if I can. I think that'll be kind of neat. Let's try. So my bison tartare is ready to go. Take a, spoon, take a spoon of this guy, throw it into the big one. So the way I do this, I'm gonna press it with the rim of this spoon and kind of go around. So that guy's flattened out like that. Second one, a little smaller. Okay, I'm gonna use the back of the spoon, press this guy down like that. And again, you can just make a big giant disc and put the chips around. I think that's the way my book looks but I feel like doing this special today for you guys out there. Okay, we'll leave that one like that. Okay, and now the smallest one. And again, guys, I'm just, I'm just messing around. I'm just trying to have some, some fun before we hit, hit the store to sign some books today. Okay, so we got our tartar and our rings. Big guy comes off like so, just pull them off like so. We're gonna pull this guy off. Pretty good, I like that too. Little guy, I like that too, that's cool. So what I'm gonna do maybe, just cause I feel like being anal about this, press things down to make it look beautiful. Now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna take these pea shoots, cause I find sometimes when you actually use pea shoots, they're a bit chewy. Um, so I'm gonna cut off a little bit of the stem. I do like the beefiness and the pea flavor of the pea shoots, cause I grew up in a garden, I just, I just really enjoy pea shoots, maybe some of the parsley I had left over from before, maybe put that on the one side. And then let's dream a little bit. What else, I got salt, I got the egg. Okay, so now I'm gonna take this egg yolk, cause this is really the big guy here that's gonna make the whole thing taste good. The cool thing is, because I just decided to do this now, it's gonna explode and pour onto the plate. Of course, right now, just because this is me showing you it already blew up a little bit, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I think actually that looks friggin' amazing. Now, a little bit of salt, boom, 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 boom. And now we're gonna hit this guy with our beloved potato chips. And I like that yolk. I'm not gonna lie to you, I think it looks really good. I'm not gonna cover it. I'm gonna put the potato chips on the one side like that. I think that looks pretty good. And so this is my bison tartare for you today. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, so we're done making the dish, the bison tartare. 
you can get my book at the link below. And the reason why I'm doing this is this is my first time actually pointing down. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna leave you to something inspiring. Cooking can be very stressful. It can be very tiring. It can be very consuming when you're cooking at home. I'm gonna tell you the easiest way to start cooking, okay? If you ever feel that you don't have it in you, get a cup of coffee, get a tea, get a glass of wine. Set it down, get a good cutting board, set it down, get a good knife, set it down, clean everything around you, start there. This is the keystone to making good food. I'll tell you why, it gives you space, it gives you a feeling of zen, you're not stressed out. Take your time, get your ingredients, put them out, slowly cut them, mise en place as they call it, get it into containers, start cooking. Do you see how easy that sounds? You can do the same thing, just take your time and enjoy it. Hi, hi, good to meet you all, good to be here for you all, thank you. Thanks, man. Knifeware.com. Yeah. Okay. Or, or just click the link below. Below? Yeah, they're, they're I can do that? Yeah. I get to do that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs>